We've spoken there about the different select committees undertaking examination of the Brexit process. One of the things which doesn't just pertain to the Brexit debate, but also I think is a, a long-running, say, complaint from select committees, is sufficient resources. In your view, given the scope of the task that lies before the government and parliament as well, will these committees require additional resources to undertake this task and their day-to-day -day role of scrutiny, examination and recommendation to the government itself? The first distinction to make is, I think, the difference between business as usual and Brexit-related business. My guess is that once we actually get embarked on this process, Brexit-related business will swallow up almost everything. Almost everything will have a Brexit label, a Brexit spin on it. So I don't think that spending huge amounts of time on things going on in other parts of the forest will necessarily be required. The, mo the rarest resource, the one under most pressure in most select committee work, is members' commitment and attention. Mm -hmm. And the amount of time that is required, will be required, for members to master a complex uh, set of issues uh, in this or that area of Brexit negotiations will be a key factor in how effective those committees are. In terms of resources, committees will judge for themselves. But my guess is that they will need some analytical, interpretative resources to help them make sense of the evidence that they're receiving. But great phalanxes of researchers, probably not. Because one of the uh, ironies, almost, about select committee work is you can have lots and lots of staff producing wonderful briefing papers, but you actually have to have a committee which is going to engage with those. There is no point in having staff-led inquiries, in effect, because you lose the political authority that members are there to give it. In terms of the committees offering a forum for engagement there, I suppose one of the fine works that the staff do is bringing in the outside views of members of the public and relevant interest groups in this as well. What channels are open to members of the public and to groups outside of Parliament who will want to feed into this process? Because it's, I feel it's often an area that isn't well understood by many people, particularly members of the public. That's an excellent point, and it plays, of course, to one of the great strengths of the Select Committee system, both in the Lords and in the Commons, but I think concentrating for the moment particularly on the Commons. And that is that the Select Committee format allows engagement with the political process. Debates and questions and all the rest, in a sense, take place in an hermetically sealed parliamentary bubble. Whereas successful select committees in this sort of environment are really good at, I'm not suggesting they should all crowdsource questions or anything like that, but uh, some may well choose to do so, and it has in the past occasionally been extremely successful. But uh, the ability to take on board expert uh, views, and indeed views not by the usual suspect experts, but more generally um, submitted by the general public, I think uh, is, should form part of the parliamentary engagement. And to answer your original question, how about how do people know what to do, the thing to do is to actually to go on the parliamentary website, www.parliament.uk, go to, uh, and it's on the front page, go to committees, you then get a choice between Lords and Commons committees and you get the whole list of the committees in both houses. You can look at their programme, you can read their publications, you can see when they're going to be taking evidence. And on www.parliamentlive.tv you can see which of those evidence sessions are going to be broadcast. And so there's going to be a huge amount of activity and information which is actually quite readily, can be quite readily tapped into by the public. And I would hope that that will form uh, the basis, the, the, the foundation for um, really good engagement. Because given that we are, as we are 
told, um, in starting down this Brexit road, we're following the will of the people, it would be very good if the people were as fully engaged as possible in the parliamentary process that's now going to follow. And of course, you can always engage your dedicated political monitoring professionals as well. Um, I just wanted to close by looking beyond the Article 50 process, because we now know that the government is committed to bringing in, in the next Queen's speech, what it's terming the Great Repeal Bill, yes. which will transfer the ACU into UK law. I suppose, for me, one of the key points of debate for this is going to be how the government could potentially revoke some of those regulations once they have become law. Obviously, the primary legislation will transfer it into mass, but how do you think the government could go about adjusting those regulations once they form part of the domestic body, as it were? The first thing to say is the sheer scale of the task. The Great Repeal Bill, and it's interesting, of course, that the Great Reform Act was only called Great after it was actually on the statute book, so this will have, I'm sure, some unglamorous title, <laughs> like the European Communities Act 1972 Repeal Bill, uh, probably. But what it will do, as I understand the government's intentions, is simply to keep in force all the um, provisions, and including, of course, the acquired rights, under the acquis, which we have compiled over the last um, 43, nearly 44 years. And that is necessary if you don't do that then uh, Section 16 of the Interpretation Act says that uh, rights acquired remain even if you repeal the mechanism by which they've been taken into UK law, but you can't add to them and new people cannot benefit from them. So you do need that sort of resuscitation uh, function of a, of a repeal bill so that it keeps everything it keeps the status quo in terms of the effect of those laws. There is then going to have to be, I think, a huge housekeeping exercise as to which bits do we really want to keep. And whether it is about the uh, fisheries regime or whether it is uh, the working time directive, whether it's construction and use regulations. I mean, it is a vast spectrum of almost every area of public policy. In the longer term, it may be that the government will want to proceed by primary legislation in each of those areas because they can tidy up at the same time as taking, asking Parliament to take a legislative decision on which bits need to be kept on. But the repeal bill itself I think will be quite a, quite a thing to get through Parliament because I can see that there will be a category of amendments where if there is a, a clause which says shall continue to have effect, which is really what we're talking about, you could put down an amendment saying save for the bits that you actually wanted to dump. So I can foresee really quite a lengthy stage of passage of that bill because, in a sense, it will be um, a preview of that discussion about which policies we want to keep, which ones we want to amend, and where we actually want to write our own position from scratch. OK. Well, that's excellent. Lord of the Spain, thank you very much for talking to us. It's been a pleasure.